الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to another episode of the methodology of the Prophets in Da'wah We concluded some of the methodology of the Prophets from the story of Ibrahim and now we move on through Ulul Azmi Minar Rusul, those of determination amongst the messengers to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. And we're going to look at some of the methodology of the prophets in da'wah from Surah Taha, the 20th surah of the Quran. And we're going to start with ayah number 24. Allah Azza wa Jal, after having shown Musa some of the miracles that he would be given. But we begin with the 24th ayah of Surah Taha. اِذْهَبَ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنِ إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ Go to Fir'aun. Indeed, he has transgressed all bounds. قَالَ رَبِّ شْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي وَجَعَلْ لِي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِي هَارُونَ أَخِي أُشْدُدْ بِهِ أَزْرِي وَأَشْرِكْهُ فِي أَمْرِي كَيْ نُسَبِّحَكَ كَثِيرًا وَنَذْكُرَكَ كَثِيرًا إِنَّكَ كُنْتَ بِنَا بَصِيرًا قَالَ قَدْ أُوْتِيْتَ سُؤْلَكَ يَا مُوسَى Musa was told to go to Fir'aun for indeed Fir'aun had transgressed all bounds. Musa made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from this dua and the subsequent ayat that follow it, we can see something of the methodology of the prophets in da'wah and in calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ رَبِّ شْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي O oh Allah, expand my chest. And the meaning of expand my chest is give me confidence, make me feel at peace, give me the ability to do my job that you have sent me to do. amri, And make my situation easy. And remove a knot from my tongue so that they understand what it is that I am saying to them. First of all, the dua of the prophets in their da'wah. And our methodology in da'wah should be that we recognize that we have no ability to achieve our aims, nor do we have the ability to call anybody without the permission and the help of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is why when Musa is told to go to Fir'aun, he replies with a dua, O oh Allah, open up my chest. And you know when you feel tight-chested, you feel stressed and you feel like your chest is tight and you can't breathe properly because you're nervous or fearful. The opposite of this is what Musa is asking for, is to expand my chest, make it easy for me to be able to do this job. Don't make me nervous, don't make me unable to deliver my message. And this shows us some things. It shows us the importance of confidence in giving the da'wah and in calling people to Islam. Having confidence and asking Allah to give you confidence and of 
being confident that you have with you the proofs and the evidences and the knowledge that you need to call the people. And this we're going to talk about in a, a subsequent episode, insha'Allah ta'ala, when we come to the da'wah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But knowing that you have the right tools, that you've made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you've called upon Allah and asked Him to give you the confidence to be able to deliver the message. And it requires confidence. And from the methodology of the prophets is to have confidence in giving da'wah and not arrogance. And don't mix up the two. Arrogance is not from the methodology of the prophets at all. Nor is ridicule, nor is bad manners and bad speech. None of this is from the methodology of the prophets alayhim salatu wasalam at all. Rather, the methodology of the prophets is confidence without arrogance, so that they would be confident in what they were saying, without being arrogant, without talking down to people, without ridiculing people, but that they have the confidence of knowing that they are delivering the right message and knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with them. From this is the importance of your trust in Allah and the fact that you recognize that you can't guide anybody Oh Muhammad, you cannot guide who you want, but Allah guides who He wants. So our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam didn't guide those who He wanted to guide, or who He loved, but He guided whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to guide. And so this recognition that we need the help of Allah, وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي Oh Allah, make this easy for me. And this is from the major du'as that the da'iyah can make when they go out to call people to Allah. رَبِّ شْرَحْ لِي صَدَرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي And then we come to the third part. وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي Take a knot out of my tongue so they understand what I'm saying. And it said that Musa had a impediment in his speech والسلام, and he asked Allah Azza wa to remove it. And there's no doubt that the prophets are the most beautiful of the people in speech, both in what they say and the way that they say it. So what you say is important and the way you deliver it is important. So from the methodology of the prophets in da'wah is not only to give attention to what is being said, but to also give attention to the way it is being said and to present the religion of Islam that all of the prophets called to in the most beautiful way for people to understand and to ask Allah to help you to be able to do that to be able to deliver the message of Islam in a beautiful, clear and concise way and that nothing of your physical nature or anything else obstruct you in being able to clearly explain the religion to other people. And from the methodology of the prophets in da'wah is clear and concise and appropriate speech. So their speech would not be rude. It would not be extensively long-winded. And of course, you must try to copy that as much as you can. And it's not easy. We all have times when we waffle a little bit. But we try our very best to copy the methodology of the prophets, especially when it comes to explaining Islam. So that the idea is that when you're explaining Islam to somebody, and again we see this, that a person you get that five minutes, that person who's not a Muslim has given you five minutes of their time and they're listening to you. And then you start with, um, well, uh, um, Islam, um, and it doesn't give a good impression. You do the best that you can to be concise and to be clear and to deliver the message in a way that people understand. This is the methodology of the prophets in Dawah. And again, it's different for different people and you do your best. And nobody's expecting you to have the eloquence of the prophets, but at least to try to coach yourself in the way that you speak, to try to deliver the message in a concise and appropriate way with appropriate language. 
Because the intention behind the speech of the prophets is not to blind people with poetry, nor to confuse people with beauty in speech, nor to draw the eyes to the eloquence of the delivery. So that they understand what I'm saying to them. And so your purpose in giving da'wah and your methodology in giving da'wah is for the people to understand. You want people to understand what you say. And that means you're going to have to tailor your style and your language according to the people you're speaking to. And we know the famous athar of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an hadithun nas bima ya'rifuna. Talk to the people in the way that they know. Do you wish that Allah and His Messenger be, be lied? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You don't want somebody to deny the truth because you didn't explain it to them in a good way. And from this is something we're going to talk about in subsequent episodes, inshaAllah ta'ala, about who should be giving da'wah and what the conditions are of the people giving da'wah. But just to allude to this here, it's not a question of saying to people, don't give da'wah because you don't have eloquent speech. But it's a question of saying to people, try your very best to concentrate and to practice explaining Islam in a simple, concise way, in a way that people understand, and try to adjust your language and your delivery. I've seen people talk and deliver a lecture to non-Muslims. And it's a collection of university students, very, very well educated one of the best universities in the UK. And the person comes and he speaks to people like the people on the street. A very rough, a very aggressive, quite sort of slang-based language. How many of those people would have turned away from Islam because of the way it was delivered? Whereas, if you had taken the opposite and put a professor with a very eloquent and very educational speech on one of the street corners, maybe the same thing would have happened. So adjust your speech to a way that it is understood and it's appropriate for your audience. We'll continue discussing Musa alayhi salatu wasalam after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The same, the same style. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just before the break, we were talking about the importance of people understanding what you say. And that means you need to adjust your language. And you need to be aware of your strengths and your weaknesses. So when you're talking to a, a lecture hall of university students who are very, very well educated, you're going to talk in a certain way. When you're talking to a general audience, you're going to talk in a certain way. For example, this series that we're doing here, there are many, many people watching this from the brothers and sisters who are very highly educated. There are people who are at a medium level, there are people who don't have any formal education at all, there are people whose English is extremely fluent, there are people whose English is of a good level, there are people who perhaps only know a little bit of English. So we have to try and keep the speech general and try to keep it as much as possible, and we ask Allah to make that easy, as much as possible in a way that it hits everybody, or at least it gets the majority of people. And if you're on the street corner, talking to people who speak in a very slang way, they have certain terms and terminology, within a respectable limit, because you always want to present yourself in a respectable way, speak to them in the way that they know. And every prophet came with the language of his people. And I'll tell you a story about some of our scholars in Saudi Arabia. One of the things that used to surprise me is that in many of the khutbahs that were delivered, some of the khatibs would speak very poetically. They would speak so poetically that I struggled to follow what they were saying. Even though at that time my Arabic was fluent, I struggled to follow what they were saying because they would speak in poetry throughout the whole khutbah. And one of the shiuk, he told me about one of his shiuk. And if I'm not mistaken, he lived in Riyadh. And he used to deliver the khutbah in the slang language of the people. Not in a really bad slang, like swearing or, or bad speech, but he would deliver the speech in a way people understood. Looking at the masjid, when the masjid is full of people who maybe they have not such a good grasp of the language, some of them have learned the language as a second language, some of them have only learned street words, you want them to benefit from the khutbah. 
And sometimes speaking in poetry and balagha and eloquence as though you're competing in a poetry contest means that only a very few group of people can understand. And if you look at the speech of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we're going to perhaps look at this later on, you see that his speech was eloquent, but it was easy to understand. You don't listen to something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and think, I don't understand that. Even when you have a reasonable level of Arabic, it's very easy to understand. And this we all extract from the statement of Musa, that they may understand what I say. So we do need to adapt our method and to speak to the people in a way that they understand. And a point for me, a helper from my family, Harun, my brother, increase my strength with him and let him share my task of prophethood. That we may glorify you much and remember you much. The greatest dua a brother has ever made for his brother is the dua that Musa made for Harun. That Allah Azza wa Jal share the task of prophethood with Harun. But what I want to draw your attention to is the statement, And this leads us to the understanding of part of the methodology of the prophets in da'wah. That we may glorify you much and remember you much. That the da'iyah is the one who remembers Allah. And the da'iyah is the one who calls to Allah. The da'iyah, the one who gives da'wah, is the one who is the strongest in worship. And one of the saddest things that we see in this day and age that we can understand from this story of Musa is that we see du'at who don't implement Islam and they don't worship Allah as he deserves to be worshipped. May Allah Azza wa Jal correct our affairs and make us from those who remember him much and glorify him much. How sad is it to think that you are going out there to call the people to Islam and you're so deficient in your worship that you don't even pray some of the voluntary prayers or you miss the most important prayers or you compromise in your da'wah by doing things that are haram or you go out to the people in a way that is haram. Like the brother who goes out having shaved his beard and says, oh, my people enter into Islam. One of the methodology of the prophets in da'wah or part of the methodology of the prophets in da'wah is that the prophets were the most people to worship Allah and the furthest of the people away from disobeying Allah. We are human beings and we make mistakes. And I'm not saying for a second that I sit here without sins. Rather, I sit here with more sins than you sit there at home with. And I firmly believe that. But I'm sitting here to say that you strive your best to worship Allah and don't allow the shaitan to get to you in a certain way where the shaitan says to you, go and do da'wah, go and do da'wah, go and do da'wah. And you miss your prayers and you miss your remembrance of Allah and you don't make dua and you don't do those individual acts of worship. Look at the worship of the Prophet ﷺ, that he would worship until his feet became swollen Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. And the Sahaba said to him about this, your previous and future sins have been forgiven by Allah. Why would you worship until your feet are swollen? The Prophet ﷺ said, أَفَلَا أَكُونْ عَبْدًا shakura." Should I not be a grateful slave? Show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember Allah much. Don't let the shaitan put you into da'wah instead of your individual worship. Rather, do your individual worship and da'wah. And it's not from the methodology of the prophets to abandon the individual worship of Allah for the sake of da'wah. Rather, they would balance the two. And da'wah is better than individual worship. When it is done in addition to the individual worship, but when it's done to the exclusion of the individual worship, then it's not better. So pray your prayers, worship Allah, pray the voluntary prayers, pray the night prayer. If you can, may Allah make you and I from those who are able to stand praying to Him at night. Make dua to Him, remember Him much. Do as many 
of the individual acts of worship as you can and call the people. And this has so much barakah in your da'wah. So much barakah. Because you are a person who the people see your worship of Allah. They look at you and they see you worshipping Allah. What did Aisha say about the Prophet Quran. His manners, his etiquettes were the Quran. You looked at him and you saw the Quran being implemented. And that's how the da'iya should be. Somebody giving da'wah, you look at them and you see them worshipping Allah. And you see them turning to Allah and you see them praying and you see them remembering Allah. And then when they tell you to do the same, your heart is open to it. As for when the person comes who is a worse liar than you and a greater cheat than you, and he comes disobeying Allah openly, or she comes disobeying Allah openly, and then comes and says, worship Allah, become Muslim, turn to Islam, this doesn't have the same feeling in the heart of the person. And then I want to turn your attention to the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal to Musa and Harun in ayah number 43. اذهبا إلى فرعون إنه طغى فقولا له قولا لينا لعله يتذكر أو يخشى. From the major methodology of the prophets in da'wa from the story of Musa is to deal with people softly. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was told in the Quran فبما رحمة من الله لنت لهم ولو كنت فضا غليظ القلب لنفضوا من حولك. For by a mercy of Allah, you were soft with them. And if you were hard and harsh-hearted, they would have run from around you. Fir'aun, the worst of the Tugha, the worst of the tyrants, and the worst of the people. Fir'aun, who transgressed that limit. And Allah said, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا Speak to him in a soft way. And the essence of your da'wah and the original principle of your da'wah is to be soft and kind and gentle in speech. And there are times when you will be a little stronger in speech and a little harsher, but these are not the basis of your da'wah. These are the exception rather than the rule. And hikmah or wisdom is knowing when to use both. But the origin and the basis and the standard and the methodology of the prophets in da'wah is to be soft. A man came to one of the khulafa and he began to speak to him in a harsh way and admonish him. And the khalifa said to him, I am not worse than Fir'aun and you are not better than Musa. And what an excellent statement this was. I'm not worse than Fir'aun and you're not better than Musa. And if Musa from the best of the prophets was commanded to speak softly to Fir'aun from the worst of mankind, then our basis and our methodology in da'wah is soft speech and a gentle approach. And the only time we move away from that is when there is a necessary exception which is dictated by wisdom that you are blessed with. And may Allah bless us with